Well, welcome to uh, this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wall. And the woman you're about to meet today is quite an extraordinary story. She calls herself a serial entrepreneur. I think that works. She started six companies before her 35th birthday. So I think she qualifies. Today, she is a fintech titan, Michelle Romano. She helps other companies start up and succeed because she's done it herself. She is hands-on. Michelle, it's so great to meet you. Oh, it's good to meet uh, another hero of mine from Saskatchewan. So loving oh, yeah. I have to say that most important thing. She was born in Saskatchewan, so we claim her. That's almost mandatory for being on the podcast, you know, Michelle. But... I love that. Now, I just, I really, really don't know where to start, except as I usually do with family, because that, those are your first mentors, your first teachers. I know your dad said to you at some point, you can do anything you want, as long as it's in engineering, you have to be an engineer. Well, how did that frame your world? Yeah, I mean, my, um, like, look, I feel like I have very deep Saskatchewan roots. Uh, My, um, my dad in Kenora with with very little. I mean, his mother had a grade eight education. His father was the town janitor and they grew up in a two bedroom farmhouse without a bathroom. And he was lucky enough that a high school physics teacher told him that he was pretty good at physics. And he ended up at the University of Saskatchewan studying engineering, where he met my mother, who was an immigrant from Czechoslovakia, had left the country, um, you know, during um during the conflict and came right. to Canada when she was 13 and you know met met my mother there and he ended up working his way up an oil and gas company and they just there was constant hard work in my house i think one of the things that's very difficult to appreciate unless you're from a place with a lot of farmers is like you know, the animals don't care, right? They don't care if you're sick. They don't care if you're tired. You have to wake up every single morning at those animals or they will perish. And there is this work ethic that comes around that, that was irreplaceable. And it's been a huge part. I mean, I still um, clock in way too many hours. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so it was a huge part of my work ethic that, that was really brought to me by my parents. Parents and, and growing up in Saskatchewan. And yeah, my my dad was very much into sciences. I was the first um girl of three girls, and then he finally got his boy at the end. And so <laughs> I was never taught that there were girl tasks and boy tasks. There was just work to be done. So I knew how to mow the lawn and shovel the driveway and change tires and do all the things that I would call probably more stereotypical male. Um tasks. So, you know, I think it was, uh, it was a wonderful upbringing and it gave me a ton of perspective and uh, work ethic. Yeah. I I'm grateful for it too. Cause very similar when you grow up, I was saying this to somebody the other day, we didn't know we were poor because everybody else was in the same boat. Like it wasn't until I left home that I thought, Whoa, we, we really didn't have much, but we, right. it didn't feel that way. It didn't yeah. feel that way at at all. And you do learn that work ethic and you, uh, because you've said on other occasions too, that, you know, it's easy to go and become a, a big time tech Titan. You know, you're the FinTech Titan. Um, if you went to Harvard or Yale, or if your parents are really rich, because having access to money means you have more access to money, but when yeah. you're making it yourself, uh, that work ethic is maybe more important. Yeah. I think that that was, um, you know, one of the things, Pamela, that I saw when I joined Dragon's Den on my first season, I, yeah. um, you know, I was I was lucky. I was 28 years old when they asked me to join the show. I thought they got the wrong person when they asked me to audition. <laughs> but I showed up to the audition being like, well, I, I have to give this a try. And I joined the cast and I was like, I am on a on a relative basis, the the poorest person here and the youngest person here. And I think felt a pretty deep sense of insecurity about that. But when I see the pictures in front of me, I am still that sure. I am still very much an entrepreneur. I, that is my, that is my, how I identify. And so, you know, I, I saw these pitches very different. I saw everyone coming on the show. A lot of them were building e-commerce companies and they were saying, look, I am willing to give up 
up, you know, 10% of my company for my first hundred thousand dollars. And what was fascinating is when you asked what those entrepreneurs needed the money for, it was always the same two things. I need money for ad spend to acquire my customers and I need money for inventory. And I was just like, why are people selling a piece of their company? Yeah. Why are you giving this never away? gonna get back yeah. for something that has a fixed return, right? You buy inventory for a dollar, you can sell it for four. You can't sell it for a hundred, right? right. Uh, you you invest money in Facebook ads, you inject a dollar, you get four dollars in revenue out. Like these are fixed return activities that can actually be really measured very well. So on the show, I remember saying, look, I'm going to just throw out a different deal type. I'm going to give you that $100,000 you're looking for. Instead of taking 10% of your business that I would own forever, I just want 10% of your revenue until you pay me back my capital plus 6%. Um, and founders are like, oh, that, that sounds like a loan. And I was like, no, a loan would have a personal guarantee. So yeah. if you didn't pay me back, I would take both your business and your house. Very, very punitive. It would have compounding interest. It would have a fixed repayment timeline. This is like, you know, you grow with me and I get paid back a little bit faster and your business slows down. I'll, I'll be alongside you for the journey. And if your business fails, that's my risk. And the founder that day is like, huh, so this is like a different type of revenue share deal. I'm like, yeah, it's like a, a royalty deal, but it ends when I get paid back my money plus 6%. Like it doesn't go on for years and years and years. So the founder that day um, took the deal. I built that into ClearCo, which has now invested more than $5 billion in more than 10,000 founders in 13 countries around the world. And the only way we could do that is by using um, data science and AI. So, you know, people plug in the, the data that runs their business and you know, we evaluate their data, not not what they look like, not where they went yeah. to school, not who they knew, not how good their pitch is. And, you know, that's that's what I was saying when you mentioned my earlier comment, right? Today, capital is allocated largely by people who know capital. And that's okay because capital is a human to human business most often. It's a, yep. I trust you. I know you. You're part of my circle. And there's a human element to it. But Pamela, that's not what I know about entrepreneurs. The best entrepreneurs did not grow up with silver spoons in their mouth and they did not grow up in easy environments. They learned resilience at an incredibly young age. They have figured out a business that works very well in often a space that was overlooked by people because it wasn't conventional. And so, you know, I knew that there were all these founders out there that were underfunded, that had great businesses. I had no idea of the scale of that. And what was even shocking to me is you look back at our portfolio today, it looks very different. Um, it looks very different. I mean, half of our portfolio is women. <laughs> yeah, that was the other thing that because you're not sitting there saying, okay, how's your pitch and how are you dressed and, and where did your parents come from and who do you know, yeah. you're actually basing it on on their numbers, are they successful? Yes. Have they thought this through? Yeah. And it's kind of you take the subjective stuff out, and yeah. and it turns out that actually a lot of women fall into that category. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, half of our portfolio is women. A third of our portfolio is BIPOC. A yeah. quarter of our founders didn't go to university or a form of post secondary education. This is yeah. a this is a group that is hugely overlooked because it's seen as like they couldn't possibly build a business. That's not true. Yeah. Um, and so when you look at data, I think magical things can really happen. Um, and you can see how large uh, some of these biases are. But, you know, I think that's our opportunity, right? I think yeah. there are so many great businesses out there that have been overlooked by the system. Is it actually fair to say, because this whole model, like lots of businesses, you know, you go to banks and they look at you and say, absolutely not. Like, you know, uh, or we're, if you sign up your house and your firstborn, we'll give you money. But, you know, short of that, uh, you can't. So there's a huge demand. Did did you at were you thinking about this be before you did the pitch on on Dragon's Den to that the one founder that needed a hundred thousand, did it just all come together for you at that moment, or did you have Clearco, this company, to approach financing in this different way already in your brain? The process of company creation, Pamela, is incredibly messy, and founders do a huge disservice when they only tell a part of right. that story. So, I mean, there was. 
this this came together over years, not days or months. And there is no eureka moments when you're a founder. Right. You can tell, right. you know, about a couple meaningful stories. But you know, I had sold a company to Groupon in 2014. I think I was looking at, you know, social media had just fully disrupted media companies. I thought the next very big phase of disruption would be the banking sector and all of these fintech companies because banks were not going to keep up with where customer demand was. Um, we started ClearCo in 2015 with the goal to help, you know, really the freelancer economy, built a product for Uber drivers that didn't quite work, built a product for Airbnb hosts, was also on Dragon's Den, saw the steal at the time, was running this experiment on e-commerce, finally get to this point where, you know, we have this meeting and um, we're like, we think we should pivot the whole company to this e-commerce product we've created and our board's like, oh, we're not sure. <laughs> you know, you you never know. But I I remember trusting in my own data being like, no, I think this is really the path. And that became an absolutely critical juncture. But there isn't, it's a really good question because I think sometimes when people want to become founders, they're looking for like one eureka moment where yeah. they like yeah. knew that something was going to happen. I it doesn't exist. You're never going to know. You're going to be getting slightly better and better data. You're going to get conflicting data on top of that. Um, and it's important that that you're working and iterating day by day. You're not looking for one moment. And um, the fear factor is there. I mean, uh, for good reason, people should be afraid, but that shouldn't be, that shouldn't stop you. That should just guide you. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is very scary to try and build something from nothing. It is the hard, like nothing exists and you have to use people and your own tenacity and your own creativity to, to birth something into the world. And while you're not, you have a tremendous amount of well seated self-doubt because there might be reason this doesn't exist. It's not, you can't just yeah. tell yourself the world is crazy. There's, there's many things that have been I'm tried. the only so, person that ever thought of this in the whole wide world. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't exist. Exactly. Yeah. So be, I, I ask about that because, you know, you're there at university, you, you've got a classmate turned business partner yeah. and you come up with this um, either brilliant or completely crazy idea that you're going to move to the East coast and, and start a fisheries company yeah. and sell caviar, the yeah. most high end product. Yeah. In, <laughs> you don't know anything about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we were we were wild. It was crazy. Um, and it's an incredible part of my story that um, you know, I meet Anatoly in undergrad. I didn't go, we gotta, we gotta start a business. And we spent all of our time playing what's the next million dollar idea. I mean, we brainstormed hundreds of different ideas that we were looking for figure out that worldwide supply of sturgeon caviar is down by 95% because the world had overfished the Caspian Sea. We're cold calling restaurants from the Queen's University Library asking why they can't get caviar on your menu. And the chefs are saying, can you ship me some? And I'm saying, well, I'm a student calling you from a library. So no. <laughs> and, um, you know, then I, we enter a bunch of business plan competitions because we think we can win money that way. We graduate with $100,000 in prize money, which is the most significant money I've ever got. Um, wow. We need $6 million to start a fish farm. So we can't start a fish farm, but we figure we can start a fishery. So we drive an old Toyota Camry to the East Coast and do all the things, get the license, meet the fishermen, uh, find a processing facility, start cold calling restaurants. And we had built this nice little business by the end of the summer, which I think is really remarkable because when I graduated to say no to your job offers and become an entrepreneur was absolutely right. insane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nobody thought that was a good idea. And, you know, we were so excited we did it. We also didn't know that there was a recession coming, um, you know, two months later. And there I am, 21 years old, selling the world's most unnecessary luxury product. <laughs> and, you know, it was a great, it was a great early learning experience. I mean, yeah. the world owes you absolutely nothing. 
and especially absolutely nothing as an entrepreneur. And I learned those hard lessons very, very early. Failure really is an MBA. I mean, there's there's no question about that, right? It it yeah. makes you go back and look at the difference, I think, between a lot of people and you is that in the face of that failure, uh, quote unquote, uh, the recession coming, you said not, I'm going to go and get a job at the Bay and Sell Shoes. You mm-hmm. said, I'm going to try this again and again and again. So what drives that? You know, I think there's a couple of things. I think you can have, when you get frustrated on the things that you see in the world, you can have uh, most times the most impact and the fastest speed in solving those problems by being an entrepreneur. And so it gives you the ability to to skip the line in a lot of things in your personal career, but it gives you the opportunity to make a lot of impact. And, you know, I have deep respect for what governments do. It is very hard to corral as many people as a government has to do. Has to. But but by definition, that makes governments very slow. And so when they want to do the right things, I mean, governments want to do the right things on a topic like climate. Um, But it's been entrepreneurs that have made the dent, right? It's been entrepreneurs that have built the electric cars and trucks that people want to drive. That is entrepreneurs that have built, you know, the Nest thermostat in the U.S., which made a a meaningful difference. It is entrepreneurs that can that can do that. And when government partners with entrepreneurs um, to to do that and to make that successful, that is when we have the fastest ability to go. And so it is I mean, for sure, it is way less scary to take a job. You do not have to put yourself out there. You do not have to, um, you know, the one of the hard parts about being an entrepreneur is, is there are no excuses. It it doesn't matter. It's all your fault. Like it doesn't matter if the market changes, you have to yep. adapt. It doesn't yep. matter if- Should have thought know, of that, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter if, you know, your employees are cheating you. It doesn't matter if the market turns. It doesn't matter if you were sloppy with a piece of work. It is your job to fix it. And- you get people that take an extraordinary amount of responsibility. I think entrepreneurs are also very down to earth because they are constantly getting, you know, sized back down because yeah. is, you know, failure is not only an MBA, but it is a it is a byproduct of success. Like you cannot yeah. be successful without some form of failure. And so I think that's what took me back to the entrepreneurial route is caring about the impact, caring about some of these problems that I deeply wanted to solve. And then, um, you know, being able to be a bit of a, of a trailblazer in doing that. You, we talked about the economic, um, you know, slap upside the head with the, uh, the caviar company, but it's been kind of a good run for business and the markets and certainly for entrepreneurs. We've been yeah. kind of, um, you know, not 13 year bull run for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Since 2008. (laughs) Most people that are younger than me have never seen the downturn that they are about to witness right now. Exactly right. So is this going to be, is this the time? I mean, I you were talking about Uber at one point, and I know Uber kind of came out of of a recessionary mindset where people say, okay, I gotta spend less, and this is a great idea, and I can just jump in somebody's car and they can make some money doing it all. Um, but then during the successful period, they're now as expensive as any way, any other way to travel. So the model kind of changes, the circumstance kind of changes. What is going to happen as we head um, pretty quickly into this recessionary mindset? What happens to entrepreneurs? Are tough times good for them or bad for them um, if they don't have that perspective? Yeah, I think everyone um, is certainly capable on how to how to learn and managing through this. You know, you had a you had a very good example, and I want to dive a little bit deeper into yeah. that. So, what happens during recessions is that consumers are far more willing to change their behavior than ever before because people are looking to save money more than ever before. So, in you know, an inflationary bull market, people are going to be like, oh, I'll just, I'll just take a cab. Why would I jump into a stranger's car? Or I'll just stay at a hotel. Why would I stay in someone else's apartment for less and hop in an Airbnb? Or, you know, I'll just get my nails done. I don't need to use Groupon or a deal website to get it done at half price. 
those were all ideas, Uber, Airbnb, Groupon that came out of the last recession. And they got mass adoption very quickly because people are so willing to change habits to save money and be economical. So when you were at the early stages, I think a recession is a great place to start a business because you're one of your largest costs, which is customer adoption or acquiring your customers, goes down rapidly because people are so much more willing to experiment with different things. Yeah. As you are a later in growth stage company, you have to adapt to a very different market. But I think for early founders wanting to start, recessionary environments are very strong and they produce an extraordinary amount of cost discipline. It was also extremely difficult to run a company, um, you know, last year, right? So let's talk about, you know, this year we've been, um, I think since March, we've been going into a recession. But when I talk about um, 2021, I mean, the cost of a software developer had gone up almost 50 to 100%. I mean, that is unfounded and completely unaffordable that, that yeah. you know, startups need to hire talent that's, you know, $250,000 to start building things. Like, there is also a, there is also a reverse side of this where there's some correction that was, needed um and yeah. that's fair, yeah so and then and then you kind of made the last comment which is you know an uber cost the same thing well every every business adapts right and so you know as you create um pricing power as you create a platform you know things will change over time um and competition will you know continue to be what serves consumers the best and and just as long as you're ready, I guess, to know that that the Uber might be a really good idea at the front end, but it might not be five years out. So you have to have that in your mind, your your ability to change and and switch to another concept. You uh, there was the other story that I heard you talk about at one point, which was so funny, which is the Airbnb and then and this notion of an RV. Like we we see these people on the highway with RVs. They're one week a year, maybe two weeks a year. Right. That's all they use them for the family holiday. And then they sit in a storage lot somewhere. Did um, it work? Oh, yeah. I mean, so so the story you're telling, um, Pamela, is uh, the story of RVZ, which was a company that came on Dragon's Den. And they said, you know, yeah. look, there are, there are 2 million RVs in Canada. They're used on average for one week a year. And we're going to connect um, the people that want to rent RVs with the people that have RVs. And right. I mean, this is a massive company that's penetrated across the U.S. Um, those founders, it was an ex-police officer from Ottawa and an ex-RCMP officer from Ottawa. They are absolutely dear friends. Um you know, Tully and I invested in them, uh, I want to say almost five or six years ago, and they have just absolutely crushed it. Um, and look, every business goes through its ups and downs, even with excellent ideas and, you know, an excellent, strong management team. This has not been a walk in a park. I mean, I remember when COVID first happened, they called me in, you know, the first four weeks and they're like, Michelle, we're getting refunds through the roof because what happens is when you book, you pay up front. And yeah. as people started to refund, it became, you know, effectively what felt like a, a run on the bank. And, you know, we're figuring out what we can do in terms of emergency capital injection. We're, we're just trying all the things and, you know, wait this out for four weeks. And now eight weeks into COVID, people have figured out they might not be getting on an airplane this year, but they right. are certainly getting in an RV and going on some sort of trip, even if it's driving. And then so yeah. sales went back up through the roof. They had the single best year on record. And so I, unless you've been an entrepreneur, I cannot quantify what it feels like to, to go through those ups and downs. Like it's just, it is an unbelievable daily roller coaster. And you have to live it to know it. I mean, it, it's not the kind of thing they can teach you yeah. uh, in a classroom. No, I, I actually think teaching entrepreneurship in a classroom is like entirely stupid to begin with. I think, <laughs> you know, if you want to learn how to, you want to learn how to be an entrepreneur, go sell candles on the side of the street. Like, yeah. like go, go knock on doors, go figure out what product market fit is. Like these are, these are intellectual concepts that, literally make no sense until you actually do them yourself. Well, we're all watching this. And I, I know you, I don't know how involved you are in the whole crypto uh, world, but you know, you watch an FTX, this guy's, uh, you know, hero turned bum in 24 hours, but lots of people like Madoff have lost 
everything. Um, how do you, what does your gut tell you about that? How, how do you know the difference between somebody who is doing the right thing and somebody who's a fraudster? Um, this is, this has been a huge crash. Yeah. I mean, the FTX story is uh, absolutely insane. Like I have yeah. no words um, for, for what was happening. And, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to see stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, like there is, there's been no point in the course of history where we haven't had some people that have tried to take advantage of some things that are happening. Yeah. And I think yeah. what we have seen time and time again is, um, you know, that, the good triumphs the evil on this stuff. And there are, you know, this is going to have, I'm not, I'm not super involved in, in the crypto space at all, but you know, there's, there's a lot of good in that space. (laughs) There's been a lot of important things built in that. And so, you know, of course you're going to have a couple of bad apples. And I mean, how do you vet that? I, I think you, you do your very best and sometimes you trust your gut instincts and sometimes you look for things and frankly, sometimes you have situations where I think, you know, things get out of people's control and they didn't fully intend for it to be like that, right? right. Yeah. Um, there is, when when you get a scandal, this, this wasn't one person and one mastermind that did this. This was, you know, a variety of factors. And that's um, not me being sympathetic. That's just the reality of of when you, you get a big story like this. But I think, uh, like... I mean, it's it is a it is a crazy story, uh, no doubt. So everybody that's involved has to take some responsibility. I mean, right. if if you want to if you want to make a quick buck and you think this is the the shortest route to being a gazillionaire, um, there's risk in that. Totally, totally. And um, and as an entrepreneur, you have to be really careful on managing your team and making sure that there's also nothing happening within your own company. Um, right. That uh, that can be problematic. I mean, it's the same thing for governments, right? We can talk about yeah, a government absolutely. scandal. We can talk about, you know, I think for the most part, these are very well intentioned people where things go wrong on the fringes, and um, and you know, doing our best to to try and um, help that is important. But your gut has to be strong, as you say. Like you like data, you like the numbers, but if somebody is going to be um, your face or your voice uh, as you build out a company or help somebody else, you've got to also just trust them implicitly. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. There is. Um, and data is really unique at the early stages of a company because you can, I mean, look, I, you, you, you know, after you work at McKinsey, you realize you can cut data in any way you want, yep. right? You, there is a way to say, I would it's like, like polls this and politics. Yeah, exactly. It's like polls and politics. I would like yeah. this narrative. Show me data that supports this narrative. Right. And so I call it, um, I call it internally like sober data, like intellectually honest, naked data. Um, because I'm like, guys, we can, we can pitch ourselves. But that doesn't make us successful. Like, let's be really honest with our own data. Are we taking actually the least attractive approach? And do we think we can be successful if really not everything we think could go well could go well? Like, how hard are you having to squint to believe the story is really what. <laughs> don't drink your own Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> don't drink your own Kool-Aid. It's, it's, yeah. it's very, very true. And the founders do do this. We're pitching all the time. We're trying to build something that doesn't exist. We're getting excited. We're doing all those things. But when we look at our own data, it has to be sober. Are the unit economics working? Do I have a cost structure that's too big? Do people really like this? Or is the cost of acquiring this consumer just astronomical relative to the value that they're bringing me? And you need to do this constantly with your team. You need to do a lot of things to make people feel good about bringing forward data that they believe in that might not always be the most attractive. Um, But then you can get real innovation. I mean, you need honesty to be able to do this. Yeah, I think you put it one way, which is there's there's no elevator. Like you got to you got to take the stairs. <laughs> I yeah. love that phrase. Yeah, I mean that's that that was uh, someone asked me about. Yeah, success. I'm like there is there is no elevator. This is you have to take the stairs. I, I there is no shortcuts in building stuff, and occasionally 
one in every 20 times you will get an idea at the right time at the right place that grows a lot faster than something else. But it's still not easy. Like being an entrepreneur in a bull run market for the last 13 years was not easy. And then I woke up at the beginning of this year and it got 10 times harder because now we're dealing with, you know, market collapses and other problems. And, and you've got to lay off people and you've got to, to alter people, And we have to do all of those things, right? Your job as an entrepreneur is to adapt. And that's what makes it very hard because, you know, we were at a growth at all cost market. We were, you know, saying we're going to expand into all these countries that, that just didn't make sense um, in a new economic climate. So about how you live and how you manage this, because I think the word that everybody uses to describe you is relentless mm -hmm. and, and, and you can work 24 uh, seven. When I started my own company, that's what I did. I ate it. I slept it. I breathed it. I, I, totally. I did it all. And you have to, if it's going to be successful, the bottom line is, you know, you got to bring in more money than goes out the door. So it's, it's pretty simple on one level, but so how do you balance that? Uh, how do you, you know, is there such a thing in Michelle's life as work life balance or is that just <laughs> silly? <laughs> um, I think there's a couple of frameworks that I use for balance. So yeah. the first framework for balance is balance is important to me over a year not over a day. So I, I wrap it like, but I'm going to borrow that one. Okay. Can I borrow you should, that? One? You should, because you know, as well as I do, has anything yeah. magical gotten done without sprinting? Like a giant piece of legislation, a huge product launch. You are sprinting. You are getting everyone on board. You are working so hard. You are turning documents at midnight. You're doing whatever it takes to get something over the finish line. You don't get to say, oh, I didn't get my eight hours of sleep tonight and I didn't get enough time to meditate those days. It's like, I'm getting something really big and really hard done. And it is going to require my full focused effort to do that. But you cannot sprint all the time. That it is just a disaster. Um, and so you have to realize, okay, I've finished this project. Now it's time for me to sleep, for me to go to the dentist, for me to do the things right. that I I need to do to remain a really functional human. And so I try and look at a year and been like, this year, did I get enough time to travel? Did I get enough time to see my family? Did I get enough time to work on, you know, creative projects that are outside of my day-to-day -day work? Mm -hmm. And I think looking at balance in that way has always been way better than trying to believe that I should work for eight hours a day, have eight hours of personal time and sleep for eight hours a day. Like <laughs> that is just, I'm never going to have that life. I don't think I even want that life. Want that life. Exactly. Um, and I've, I've been able to look at balance over a year. Um, I will confess the only thing uh, that that doesn't work with this philosophy is is working out. You can't just start exercising on December twenty third and not yeah. run and run until you know literally run marathons until December thirty first and hope your body's going to do that. You do need to yeah. figure out how to fit some of that in because um, you know I, I heard a great framework recently, which is that you know we have made diet and exercise in our culture so much a part of looking good. Yeah. And it becomes very easy to be resentful because you're like, well, I shouldn't give, you know, I, I shouldn't care about what people think about that, which is true. Um, but you should care about diet and exercise because it's 85% of your mental health yeah. and you For being you. Yep. a functional, happy, you know, human being is you getting outside, seeing sunlight, having some level of physical activity. And I think we have, and eating healthy things, right? Like we've completely lost that narrative in the narrative to look good. And so I love that framing. I'm like, Michelle, you're not here to be another five pounds skinnier. You're here yeah. because it's, it's really good for your brain. And I think if we frame that as a society, we'd do way better. But, um, and then finally, the last piece of a balance is it, it does not feel like work when you work with people you love and mm -hmm. you just spend hours in the office and hours brainstorming. And it's hard to define if you're just, you know, yeah. shooting shit and having fun or if you're yeah. solving. No, I think that's problem. do something you love. And then it's how do you balance the other stuff or how do you fit in? Maybe I'll put it that way. Like you need news and information if you're going to be sparking ideas and seeing what trends are. Um, but how do you control the intake? Because 
that too is relentless. That flow of information over us all the time. Do you do you limit your time on social media? Do you watch news once a day, once a week? Like, how do you keep the input there, but yeah, yeah. let it not overtake? So, I mean, my honest answer is I don't. I don't have a full strategy for this, but I do go through phases. I go through phases yeah. where I'm like, I'm spending way too much time on my phone. I'm spending way too much time on social media. I find my team does a really good job of like telling me, you know, what kind of news I need to pay attention to. And then like everyone yeah. else, you find, you find these stories that you get enthralled in because you just kind of can't um, believe them. And so I think you can do a decent job curating your feeds to constantly be like, is this positive and is this helpful? Um, and, um, you know, I love this line that you're the average of the closest five people in your life and <laughs> really looking at those five people and being like, is this bringing out, um, the best or the worst in me? But yeah, I've gone through all those phases. I've gone through phases where I, you know, will log out of Instagram. I will look at social media platforms because I just need to focus. I go through phases where I think, um, the news can be incredibly untrustworthy and, you know, we're, we're painting a single narrative versus looking at yep. nuance. And, you know, one of my hopes for society is that we can get a little bit better at being right and then being wrong, right? I think that COVID was a perfect example of every month we were getting new data and we needed to reevaluate things on new data. And we governments became, you know, I have chosen the this path or the this path, you know, the right. Sweden path or the lockdown path. And instead of every month saying, well, I got new information, I got to make a new decision, we were saying, and 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 the public does this to politicians. The public says, well, you flip-flop and and yeah. they make it terrible and they make you seem like a hypocrite. Well, that's not true because as an entrepreneur and as any person, you have to make the best decision with the data you have to begin with. And so yeah. it would be, I think that that would be probably the most important part of, of the new cycle and changing people's minds and having people have an open mind is that we should be allowed to change our minds when we get new information. Yeah. I, I've said that for a very long time about how journalists cover politicians. We yeah. should, in theory, if somebody has read something new and thought a new thought we should reward them for that not punish them for that yeah. but we say you know oh you did a 180 you know oh you've changed your mind oh you can't be trusted and and that's what happened in covid too it all became politicized if you were if you believe this then that was you were a part of that ideological team and yeah. and that's not helpful to anybody cuz we were all struggling trying to figure out what the hell to do especially exactly you know <laughs> kids or if you should yeah. get on a plane and try and make a business deal. No, it's really um and then you've got the these other added things of uh of being a celebrity, which yeah. you probably hadn't really planned on. Uh but the television side does that uh to you and, and that's a, a great thing because you get feedback. It's nice. People stop you in airports and say, <laughs> you know, hey well, you I know what this is like you're a celebrity too. Yeah, it, you you get that, but there's a downside because everything is public, and you sometimes you just need that thought process. Sometimes you need to sit on the plane and be quiet, and then everybody goes, "Ah, oh, she's rude." Oh, she's just not. You know, you're you're trying to balance that too. Totally, totally. Um, yeah, a celebrity status is a true double-edged sword. Yeah, and before you do this, you have to think really carefully about what you want. Do you want to be powerful? Do you want to be rich? Do you want to be famous? Or do you want to be all three? <laughs> but um, there are, and I mean, you've seen it, there are very significant downsides. Oh, she's not friendly and she's a snob and she's not, yep. you know, hugging my kid. And like, it's like, it's sometimes um, you just need a, a moment to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think in general, um, my experience with being a celebrity has been, uh, net positive, I would say like yeah. there, I think people I've gotten to share and inspire a lot of people to become entrepreneurs, which I think is a really important to the fabric of a strong society. If you look at all of our, all of the strongest countries, they have very, very strong, um, entrepreneurial environments and they are, have entrepreneurs that are not there to fail. They have entrepreneurs that are resentless, uh, relentless, not resentless. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
And it takes a lot of guts to become a founder. And so if I can encourage a few more people to do that, a few more women to do that, a few more people that don't look like the conventional founders in the world, I think I've made, um, you know, an important mark for me. And I think, um, I also have not never inflated my own self-ego. Like I'm a kid from Saskatchewan at the end of the day. And all of this has blown my wildest expectations for what I thought my life would be. Um, And I have gotten to be a part of things and see things and build things that I, you know, I, I remember thinking if I ran a company with two people in Regina, like that would be great. (laughs) And so this is all kind of above um, what I thought was possible. I have not lost months of self and my family. And I don't think I deserve any of this. I also think that this could all be taken away from you, right? There is lots of stories where um, there's declines of businesses and and people's trends change. Trends change and you never know exactly what's going to happen. And so I think remaining um, humble and helpful is is pretty important throughout that period of time. And family and your community teaches you that too. Like you know, when, that's important to have that balance that we keep coming back. Yeah, you're you're famous and you're a celebrity and you've done all this, but you're still just my daughter or you're still just my friend, right? The person I've known since since grade school and, and so no fluff. You have to be careful about who's in your life though too, don't you, in terms of not surrounding yourself with negative people or, you know, like it, it sounds kind of... Um, uh, a difficult thing you have to do, but sometimes you have to cull people out of your life that are holding you back. Yeah. Um, that wasn't a very nice way to put it, but <laughs> I, 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 actually, I thought it was a farming term. I was like, yeah, I know. What it is. <laughs> um, I, um, no, I, I actually like people that speak in truth and reality. Yeah. That's sure. one thing. Yeah. Like, I, I think that is important. And some people, um, I, I like, you know, some people come into your life for a reason, a season or a lifetime. Yeah. And there is, I, I actually really believe in this concept of, of chapters and that. Mm-hmm. I think it's, yeah. I think it's, I mean, this is a, a bit of a tangent, but I do think it's important. I mean, I think it's bizarre that we use the term X when we refer to someone that we dated or married. Um, yeah. previously. It's, it's ridiculous. It's like, would you, refer to your university years as your like X early career years, like university X learning years. Yeah. X <laughs> learning years. Like yeah. that, that's just not the case. There is, um, you know, I, I treasure my university years. I mean, I had a very public, uh, I started a company with my co-founder. I had a very yeah. public breakup with him. We had we were, we were great. Our, our relationship was over. We wanted to run the company together. We were awesome co-founders. Um, and everyone wanted a story here. And I was like, guys, there's no story. And he's not my ex. He is my yeah. current co-founder. And yes, we yes. had seven incredible years together that I would never want to be referred to as ex anything. Yeah. And so really, you, really good point. Really good. Like it, it's, and so, you know, instead of thinking of calling and 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 there is times where people are just it's they're not in their right place you're not in their right place the gel right. between the two of you are not working this this literally applies to parents colleagues families all of the things human relationships are extremely complicated and um and there is it is okay to be like that was an incredible era and yeah. now that era might be over and you know what That era might start again at some point when, you know, you and I are in a, in a better place, but it is important. There are people that drag us down. There are people that create drama. And frankly, I, as an entrepreneur, I have so little time. The last thing I have time for is drama. If if people do not want to be upfront and honest, um, it, it's just not going to work. And if they want to be constantly negative, it's just not going to work. I have, we have a rule at ClearCo that you have to be willing to say something to someone's face. And so we actually have the other person accountable to that. You know, I call you Pamela and I want to talk about your colleague. You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to be like, Michelle, I can hear that you have some great points. You're supposed to dial in that colleague. And we're like, the three of us can have a conversation Yeah, yeah. because the gossip train is 
uncontrollable and it is such a giant waste of people's times. And it is so easier, so much easier to either agree to agree to disagree, to yeah. disagree and commit that we are moving forward or to agree. But, but the the senseless back and forth, I mean, that is an enormous waste of time. In, yeah, it really is. In politics, in families, in and yeah. um, <clears throat> so look, I, I think that that is it's a really important point. It's a point that most people don't want to do. Most people are largely conflict avoidant. And um, yeah, sometimes you just need different things in your life and never refer to a, a previous part of your life as an ex anything. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, that's a really interesting point. And, and one of your other great lines, don't take advice from someone that you don't want to be. Yes. Like that, that is so smart. It's so simple. <laughs> it's so simple, but I can't tell you how like, <clears throat> so I'll get, you know, a, a, an, an upcoming entrepreneur and they'll tell me that their mother doesn't think this is a good idea. And I'm like, well, what does your mother do? And, and I mean, I'll use my mother. My mother is a, is a nurse that would, would struggle to take a risk on parking in a spot that said no parking. I mean, my right, entire right. life I have parked in parking spots that say no parking. Right? Like, <laughs> If you are not willing to take that risk, you are not going to be a successful entrepreneur. Like that sign <laughs> is the suggestion. <laughs> so yes, exactly. And, and I think there is like a risk tolerance. So it's like, if, you know, well, you can take advice from your mom on this one, but if you, if you want your mom's career path, that's what you should take her advice on. Exactly. But if you don't want that career advice, you should take advice from another entrepreneur. And so we also do this thing where um, many humans do this thing where they ask a lot of people for advice. And I'm also uh, very anti that because I think it's a, it's a giant waste of time. And I think you're going to get five contradictory answers. And so you are no, you are actually more confused. <laughs> you have wasted more people's time. You've wasted your time. You should call two or three people that you would like to be in that situation that lived through that situation. And they will give you, especially if you get them in an honest place, excellent advice yeah. on what to do and what to look forward to and how to avoid a big problem. But man, oh man, I see this all the time. You know, my parents are telling me this, my boyfriend's telling me this, my co yep. like, are, do they have any experience doing what yeah, you're doing? Right. No, <laughs> no, uh, this is, it's, and it's good advice, not just for entrepreneurs, it's good advice in life. Yeah. Like don't, don't, you know, be careful who you ask about for a judgment on your relationships or whether yeah. you look good or what, you know. You it's so true. So, Pell, this is a great story. So I actually believe always in asking like beautiful people who are aging well what they do. And I'll yeah. do this all the time. I'll see someone in a coffee shop and their skin looks great. And I'm like, you know, your skin looks amazing. Can you just, can you tell me what you do? And because I don't trust the internet to tell me any right. of those things accurately. Yeah any of them, because they're all trying to sell you something. That woman in a coffee shop that doesn't know who I am, that doesn't know I'm a celebrity, they have no idea. And I have heard the craziest things. I have heard, I wash my face with antibacterial soap and I just use witch hazel. I have a, I have a six cent skincare routine. <laughs> like, but this is what I mean. You, you ask people or the person that has been in what you believe is a really successful 30 year relationship. They right. should be giving you relationship advice, exactly not right. the people who have a joint interest in dating you or your parents that have a vision for what they want you to be. And it, it's so, so, so true. Um, it's so true. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I asked you for a little advice about a lot of things today. It is just wonderful to have this conversation with you. You're smart. You're funny. You're successful. You're from Saskatchewan. What else matters? I mean, really. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, this was this was delightful. We got through a lot of, um, yeah, I, also I think, think very unconventional topics. And yeah. I think Canada needs more Saskatchewan. I think the yeah. world needs more Saskatchewan. This is one of the hardest working place of incredibly yeah, yeah. people that are exceptional builders. And so, you know, if folks are listening to the podcast from Saskatchewan, like there is no better time to build. It doesn't matter that we're in a recession. Uh, you don't need a lot of money. You need a lot of grit, which yeah. I think the folks from Saskatchewan are genuinely born with. And I would love to see, you know, more and more startups from there. So great. Michelle Romano. Fintech Titan. Don't you love that title? <laughs> you know her from Dragon's Den. Uh, she is an entrepreneur in her heart and soul. 
and uh, really good advice for people. What we all need to be thinking about, because there's some tough times ahead for uh, sure. for all of us. So this is good. Michelle, all the very best. Let's hope 23 gets to be a better year. I hope so. so this much. has been one hell of a year. And I'm sure it's been one hell of a year for you too. It's, yeah, it, it really has, I think, for everybody. So you take care. Have a have a good, take a little break. Take Thank a little you. break. Go see some family. Thank you. I'm going to try to for sure. Yeah. All right. I hope we talk again soon. Yeah. Okay. It was so lovely to meet you. Thank you for doing this. Mackenzie and Paul, thank you as well for for getting this done and being very flexible with timing. I really appreciate this. I know we had to move this a couple of times. Busy people get stuff done. Busy get stuff done and they just figure out that (laughs) slot. And uh, okay, we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. That's it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. We'll talk soon.